Can you please tell us about the signs of the hour and how to prepare for them? Uh, the signs of the hour and how to prepare for them. So, um, the signs of the coming of the hour, and we just had two, which are sahih, there's no question about them. Uh, they are very, very many. <clears throat> they fill volumes, which means that the Prophet wasallam talked about that a great deal and he gave it a great deal of attention and in the signs of the end of time you have early signs okay those are things that have happened already the birth of the prophet وسلم, is one of those um, of course the sending of the prophet وسلم, is one of those the death of the prophet is one of those وسلم. even he says that that his death will be one of the signs of the end of time. <clears throat> um, the conquest of Jerusalem, that is one of the signs of the end of time. That's a good sign, um, the conquest of Jerusalem. Um, the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab is one of the good signs because he is a door between the ummah and between fitna. And then also we know that the best of all generations um, is the first generation of the Sahaba, then the Tabi'een and the Atba' Tabi'een. That's a sign of the end of time. But that's a good sign and it's a sign the purpose of which is to give you confidence that you can take your deen from them and it will be sound and it will be safe. Um, <clears throat> And then there will be Ugaylima min Quraysh. There will be little boys from Quraysh who will destroy this religion. That's an early sign. Yazid ibn Muawiyah is the first of them. And the people with him. And they kill Imam al Hussein. And that's one of the signs of end, end of time. Even Abu Huraira knew the year in which Imam al Hussein would be killed and he said, Oh Allah, don't let me see that year and he died the year before it. <coughs> so these are signs <coughs> of the end of time and they're early signs and Islam is destroyed by Yazid but then it is restored by Zayn al Abidin although the wound will last until the day of judgment. But Zainul Abidin, may God be pleased with him, he restores the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, of Khidma and Mahabba. And he had around him people that he taught as a Shaykh and gave them tarbiyah. And then he sent them out so that they established that there's no hatred in this religion. There's no vengeance in this religion. After the death of Imam al Hussein, hearts are destroyed hearts are ruined and then Zayn al Abidin gives them life again but the wound that is there will be a wound that will fester until the end of time <coughs> so there, there are many signs like that the Khawarij are one of the signs of the end of time but they're an early sign but they're a sign that repeats <coughs> because you have signs that happen one time such as the birth of your wonderful Prophet ﷺ. But you have signs that repeat. And among the repeating signs is the Khawarij. And the Khawarij are people who are known by takfir. <coughs> they declare the takfir of the believers. And they are people of violence and rigidity and arrogance and superficial knowledge and the Prophet ﷺ described them and warned against them and they every time that you destroy one generation of them so they don't they're not always lasting they'll be cut off but then another one will come back until the last of them fight with the Antichrist they will be the soldiers of the Antichrist 
<coughs> and the Prophet وسلم, described the Khawarij as dogs of hell. Kilabu nar, Kilabu ahlin nar. And ISIS is like that. Killing innocent people, people that will go into a mosque and kill all the believers. What, what are you? Dogs. You know, you had this unfortunate incident uh, just a short time ago, right? So the man wants to blow up mosques and he kills innocent people. I'm sorry, dog of hell. The Prophet warned us about this very much. Then you have middle signs. <coughs> you have signs that come from between the middle and the end. <coughs> and one of those is a volcano that will appear in Hijaz and its light will be seen in Syria at night time so that you could see its lights shining on the necks of the camels in Basra or Busra in the city of Basra in the desert of Syria. Did that ever happen? Yes, it happened. <coughs> and that is a great volcano that erupted just outside Medina. Um, when you go to the airport in Medina, you'll see this thick lava flow that is as tall as from the ground to the rafters, and sometimes taller. Many of you, you've seen it, haven't you? I've seen it many times. It's right out there where the airport is, and it's very thick. Okay, that is the lava flow of that volcano. And that volcano, <coughs> um, was expected to consume all of Medina. And one geologist who went with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to Medina looked at it and he said, how in the world could this ever have been stopped? It should have gone all the way to the Prophet's mosque, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But all the people went to the mosque and they prayed and they cried and they prayed and they cried and it, it stopped. But the light from that volcano was so bright that in Syria you could write books at night time. You could read books at night time. And indeed, you could see the reflection of it on the necks of camels. So that's a sign. And is it a good one? Uh, I don't remember dates and I don't have my notes. I speak from a computer. And when I don't have my computer, I'm in a sad situation. But that volcano happened uh, just before the Mongol destruction of Baghdad. The destruction of Baghdad at the hands of the Mongols comes about two years after that. And in fact, the Mongols had appeared before that, Genghis Khan. But in fact, uh, the people of Medina wrote to the people of Baghdad and they say, get ready for trouble. So they knew it was an ominous sign. And uh, you have many middle signs. And I'm going to pull out the one I like the best. Okay, this is one of the middle signs. Pins will be everywhere. You have a pin, you have a pin, you have a pin. I bet you have a pin. Do you? Okay. And you've probably got three or four. And probably you've got decorated ones and cute ones and... And I've got ones I like. I'm really particular about pins. I don't like all pins. It's got to write a particular way, you know. But pins will be everywhere. Knowledge will be accessible everywhere. And uh, the Prophet told us about airplanes. He told us about automobiles. He told us about oil and the oil wealth and the oil wars. And he told us about many things. Um, he also told us that at the end of time, former enemies of Islam <coughs> would begin to enter the faith. And this is something we see happening right now. Of course, you have Europeans, and I'm of European background, uh, who are coming into Islam. And our ancestors were not necessarily your friends. You know? And uh, then you have also people like uh, the Mongols, of Genghis Khan. And now you have 
many Mongols embracing Islam, which really displeases the Mongolian government because they don't like Islam. And you have tribes in Africa that have been, you know, bitterly opposed to Islam and Christianity <coughs> for centuries who are now coming in by the hundreds. So that's one of the signs of the end of time. And Islam will spread everywhere. It, there will be no place where the message of Islam is not known. Um, there's another one, is, which is, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ مَكَّةَ قَدْ بُعِجَتْ كَوَاظِمْ If you see Mecca having been gutted, بُعِجَتْ, with tunnels. Okay? I made pilgrimage the first time, 1973. Uh, that was a beautiful Hajj. It was December 1973, January 1974. You weren't even born then. You know? And uh, it was a beautiful pilgrimage. And I did it on foot. I was a poor, and I was living in Cairo in those days. I was studying at AUC. Um, my wife had given birth to our first baby, Iman. And in fact, we had a really dear Egyptian sister who loved us very much. And she said, it's got to be Iman. It's got to be Iman. So we named her Iman. It's a beautiful name. <coughs> and, uh, but the doctor, uh, Dr. Muhammad Fayyad, who was very well known, I think he's passed now. Allah have mercy on him. Uh, he did it for free. He didn't charge me anything. Even though it would have, you know, it would have been a reasonable price, but he said, no, no. He said, I do this lillah. Thank God bless him. <clears throat> and so I took that money and I made pilgrimage from Egypt on Egypt air. <laughs> and um, mashallah, you know, but there were no tunnels. There wasn't in Mecca a single tunnel. Right? And it was, it, it, it is always beautiful. <clears throat> but um, you could walk up on the mountains and I'm going to guess that there wasn't a single building towering over the mountains. There might have been, but I didn't notice any. Because most of the buildings were old buildings from the 1800s, the 1700s. You know, beautiful, built with these different colored bricks. And so when you see Mecca gutted with tunnels, and you see tall buildings towering over the mountains, then expect the hour. Okay, that's a sign of the end of time. But that's a middle sign. And you have many, many others. Um, the Prophet told us about colonialism, imperialism. He told us about people like, um, you know, what's his name? The ruler of Mecca that uh, cooperated with Lawrence of Arabia. He's not mentioned by name, but, you know, in some of the hadith about, uh, you know, the fitan, at dahma you know, then it talks about a man who thinks he's of Ahl Bayt, of Ahl Bayti, you know, and he will do these things with the enemy. So, um, you have many things like that. And then you have Al Fatratul Huthaiya. Al Fatratul Huthaiya. Uh, the time <coughs> when, uh, God forgive us, Muslims will be like Huthaiya Sayyid. They'll be like the foam on the top of the gushing rainwater. I mean, I hate to say that. Don't you hate to hear that? But then look at us today. Look at us today. You know, and uh, we are in a very desperate state. But the Prophet said that. You'll be like that. And you have other signs like Ummatikal Matar. La yudra. My ummah is like the good rain that brings life to the earth. It will not be known, maybe not even on the day of judgment, when they weigh the books, which is better, the first or the last. Because there will be in the end of time beautiful men and women, brothers of the Prophet, who will bring this religion back to life. That's a miracle, isn't it? And it's a miracle of the Prophet And how can that happen? 
you know that's impossible. And I know it's impossible. But I know Allah can do the impossible. You know, and we believe, we, are, we have a shaykh who is a specialist in the impossible. You know, so um, that will happen. And then you know the hadith about Ikhwani, when the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ishtaqtu ila Ikhwani, I yearn for my brothers. And the Sahaba said, um, we are your brothers. Because they want him to be happy. He said, no, you're my ashab. You're my companions. My brothers are a people who will come later who didn't see me. And they would give anything just to see me. And they will have the rewards of 70 of you companions. 70 of you. And then one of them asks, uh, of us or of them? And I'm glad he did because we want to be sure. And he said, of you. The companions. They say, Lima ya Rasulullah, how can that be, O Messenger of God? And he said, Because you have helpers, they will have no helpers. Do you have helpers? Do you have helpers? I mean, I believe that you and I are quite fortunate, but I know that most Muslims are not. The one who's supposed to help you will betray you. The one who's supposed to guide you will misguide you. The one who's supposed to lift you up will put you down. The one who's supposed to protect you will turn you over to harm. And we live at a time, brothers and sisters, you be strong. When false sheikhs appear every day and this breaks our hearts. This breaks our hearts. It's like every other hour. And people that know this can't be true of him. But then she said he did it. 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 The patterns repeated dozens of times. And then you begin to say, oh my God, like there were indications all along but I didn't have the sense to see it. Okay, so you have a helper? That's help? Now you'll be struggling to keep your faith. Right? You will. This is happening to us. You know, this is happening to us right this minute. Right this minute. And, you know, so you have no helpers, <clears throat> but inshallah, we will help each other. And there's only one thing that I ask of you, and only one thing I ask of myself, let us be honest, let us be truthful, let us be people who don't break the trusts. And you can do that, right? And if you can, you can do that, you are the winner. And may we find all the people who are umana, all the people who are trustworthy, and I believe I'm looking at many of them, some of them, and there are others as well. I know brothers like a Dutch Muslim, for example. Uh, God forgive me for mentioning his, his nationality. You know, who is one of the most beautiful people you will ever see. But before Islam, he was on the verge of suicide. He was on the verge of suicide. Even though he's extremely intelligent, he's extremely learned, he's extremely gifted. Okay, but Islam saved his life. And now he gives everything to this deed. And his wife, and he wouldn't betray anything. I believe that. And his wife is the kind of person that <clears throat> I don't think it's possible for her to betray a trust. And you know people like that, don't you? You know people like that. That's the people we have to be. You don't have to know a lot. You don't have to have studied for years. Just be honest for God's sake. Just be truthful for God's sake. Don't betray trusts. That's what's needed right now. Is amana. Amana. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So, they will have no helpers and therefore you, and you suffer. And I know you suffer. And sometimes these things hit us so heavily 
I mean, sometimes I feel like this doesn't bother me anymore. I've seen it too many times, but it does. It does. It crushes you. Right? It crushes you. So we don't have any helpers, do we? And that's why we have to help each other. You know, we're like orphans. And we will stand by each other. We will help each other. So you have middle signs. <clears throat> and then you have end signs. And the end signs begin with the Mahdi. And the Mahdi is a real man. Okay, and his name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he's from Ahli Bayti Rasulillah. But he's preceded by many Mahdi's. So you have to know that. Imam al Maturidi, who is one of the great scholars of Islam, and he's one of the great scholars of Usul and Maqasid in the Hanafi school, he stands out. Ma'akhid al Shara'i'a. In other words, he was called Mahdi Zamanihi. He was called the Mahdi of his time. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani also. And is he the Mahdi? No, he's not the Mahdi. <clears throat> but he, will, he belongs to the army of the Mahdi. And he sets things right. He removes doubts. He gets things together. <clears throat> and when the Mahdi comes, the Muslims will be okay. Not like now. He won't come in a time like this. This is not the time of the Mahdi. You know, when he comes, the Muslims will be all right. They will be those brothers. They will be that rain, that fresh rain. Okay? And when the Mahdi ha comes, there's very little time left. And all the rest of the signs, they come like pearls on a necklace that's been cut falling off so it's just two or three years and the world's over two or three years and then you have when the Mahdi comes the Dajjal the Antichrist now the Antichrist is preceded by many Antichrists just like the Mahdi is preceded by many Mahdis and you can look at many people, um, no need to be calling names, you know, but you can look at many people in our time, <laughs> the 19th century, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, um, Mao Zedong, uh, we could name some Muslims, but I don't really want to do that, you know, um, Ataturk, for example, you know, they are the jealous. They are Dajjals. They belong to the army of the Dajjal. And many people today do too. Like the president of my country, for example. These are evil people. They're evil people. And they do the work of the Antichrist. And look at the movie industry. You know, you know in, in the end of time, people give up principles and they adopt ideals and false universals. And they give up justice and they adopt sentimentalism. Sentimentalism. Okay, and this is one of the main things, you know, that false politicians and others do. Sentimentalism. And, you know, if we know the history of the Nazis in Germany, I know that pretty well. Sentimentalism is the key. This is a piece of German earth. The little girl comes as she comes up to Hitler with her bouquet of flowers. The Saarland, the Saargebiet is now Deutsch. You know, so this is a piece of German earth. And the Germans all cry, right? That's sentimental, sentimentalism. And they did that, they played that for decades. Um, and we see it in movies. You know, like, uh, for example, um, uh, let's just take one that's maybe not that bad, and that's the Titanic. Okay, the sinking of the Titanic was one of the biggest signs of God of the 20th century. Okay, and we used to talk about nothing but that. And I used to always tell my students about the Titanic, you know, 
And, you know, we would, like, look at the sign of God. This huge ship, the man who built it, he says, it cannot sink. Even God can't sink it. <clears throat> and it sinks on its first maiden voyage. That's not a sign of God? It is. And then you take that incredibly powerful story and you turn it into a story of adulterous love. Adulterous love. That's what he did. That's all false. It's all made up. But it's all extremely sentimental, right? Jack! Jack! You know? As he disappears. And then, in the end of the story, she throws her little diamond, whoops! You know, into the Atlantic. And then she dies and she goes down to the ship and there's a big party. And you're crying. And I'm crying. And I'll cry before you do. I'm the most sentimental of them all. I'll be the first to cry. But that's sentimentalism. And so everything that she stands for, and everything that Jack stands for, which includes adultery, you know, it's not that bad. See how they do? And you could get a lot of other examples. And that is Antichrist. And that's not the worst example, because that is a pretty good movie, <laughs> right? But there are others that are not so good. So I'm sorry that you're cold. <laughs> um, so you have signs of the end of time, and those signs are the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is real, and he has to appear because the Mahdi is there. Otherwise, he works behind the scenes. And when he appears, the natural order begins to break down. Yes? I have a question that could be related to that. Um, what about homosexuality? You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm German. Shh. No, but I'm... Why? Well, you want me to lose my citizenship? <laughs> no, but I, I'm German. I'm German. And in my country, it's mm -hmm. legal that homosexual people mm -hmm. marry and even adopt children. Yeah. And this is something for me unacceptable. Well, in any case, God bless you, but, um, you know... Uh, How do we deal with this? I mean, like, yeah, in any case, that's a big question. Yeah, and that's a dangerous question, because if I say the wrong thing, I can't go to England anymore, and I can't go to Germany anymore, and I can't go to Australia or New Zealand, because I have hate speech. And, you know, so we have to be careful, because people might post it on Facebook. Do you know what Dr. Amor said? Okay, no visa. And, uh, but I was going to give an example of movies, right? Okay, she's shaking her head, she knows what I'm talking about, and I'm not going to say. But, you see, it's all sentimentalism that makes you say, this can't be that bad. Come on. Yeah. You know, so, um, they work on sentimentalism, that's really, really important. And, with the Antichrist, the natural order begins to break down. And then comes the beloved, majestic Christ, the Tiger, Jesus Christ. He comes back a second time. And when he comes back, the Mehdi, you know, is defended. Because the Mehdi will have a hard time with the Antichrist. And then Jesus comes back. And the Dajjal, the Antichrist, begins to melt. And the main thing the Antichrist does is Dajjal, which means you do Qalbul Haqqaiq. You turn things upside down. Black is white, white is black. Good is bad, bad is good. Um, we had our Zawiyah, which some of you were able to attend. I wish we could have all been there. But we would have had to have a Titanic. <clears throat> and I don't think it would do that well in the Nile. I don't know. But, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the Zawiyah, we talked about how in the last few hundred years, the way we think, the values we hold, all of these things have been, in many cases, fundamentally changed and sometimes in ways that you wouldn't think are serious but they are serious little things like 
getting rid of the concept of essence. And you might not even know what that means, essence. But essence is what you're referring to when you say I, me, myself, that's your essence. And so you get rid of the essence and then you have the dominant theory or whole perspective of the time, which is nominalism. That things are just the collection of their parts. So you are a name. You're not an essence. That doesn't sound so serious, does it? But it is. That's really serious. All metaphysics, all definition, all first principles out the window. And not only that, um, you know quantum physics? Quantum physics that studies subatomic particles? The subatomic particles are weird. And it's like they live. And it's like they make choices and they're unpredictable, right? And you have certain paradoxes, like we have one that's called a cat, Schrodinger's cat, okay, who's both alive and dead at the same time. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But they can't solve that. Why? Because there's no essence. If you put essence back into your worldview, you can solve that problem. That is a nominalist world that cannot understand, because this problem is metaphysical. So that doesn't sound like a big thing, but actually it is. And actually some people would say it's the biggest thing. One person is Richard Weaver, who is a very brilliant American thinker. So the, the Dajjal, he does things like that. Get rid of essence, you don't see it, it's not there. And you don't think that's serious, but it is, and he knows it is. He turns things upside down. That's why when we teach Aqidah, you know, we have to teach people how to think. How do you know the truth? How do you know what is true? And then you have Gog and Magog, yet Juj and Ma'juj. And what do they do? They kill all the followers of the Antichrist. That they all the followers of the Antichrist, they kill them all. And they're and they're not real I mean they're real, but they're unreal. But the natural order is not working anymore. The world's at the end. It's not like the world you knew. And ultimately the sun will rise in the West. That's not like the world you knew. And the Gog and Magog will try to get you too. But you have to be protected, and you'll be protected by Jesus Christ. He will protect you, and then they will be destroyed. And then you have other things, uh, the rising of the sun in the west, the beast of the earth, uh, you have a riha tayyiba, you have the nice breeze, you know, that's soft as silk and sweet as musk, and the night that that comes, no believer will be alive in the morning. All believers will be gone. Then you have the taking away of knowledge, the taking away of the Qur'an. Of course, you won't have any believers reciting it anymore, but some say even the letters will be taken out of the Mus'hafs. You have the destruction of the Kaaba. The Kaaba will be destroyed, and it's an Ethiopian that will lead that. And why does he destroy the Kaaba? Because there are no believers anymore, so why does he care? Gold, because there's treasure beneath the Kaaba. So this is what he believes, and many people do believe that. I don't know if it's true or not, and to me it's not important. But he will destroy the Kaaba to try to get the treasures that are beneath it. And he doesn't care. It's not like, I'm doing this because, you no, know, there are no Muslims anymore, I'm sorry. No one is doing tawaf anymore. And people, some people even go back to idolatry. And there'll be no believers, and they will do horrible things, and then the hour will come. But, you know, once the Mahdi appears, the time from then until the blowing of the trumpet is a short time. It's just a few years. So don't think it's happened already, because it hasn't. This is not the time of the Antichrist. This is not the time of the Mahdi. Okay, this is a time before that. And when will it happen? Well, we don't know. 
But the, but the most important thing is you learn from the sign of the end of times that there is an order of good and there is an order of evil. So where do you want to be? The order of good. And I think that this is a representation of that order. That we hope that, don't we? That we are part of the order of good. We're not the order of good because it's so much bigger than we. But we are part of that. So you have to be in the order of good. <clears throat> and there is an order of evil. And you don't want to be in that. And every prophet from Adam warned of the Antichrist. Why? It's a long time coming. And that's because the order of evil, which is the work of the Antichrist, is there always from the beginning. You know, Adam and Eve give son to give birth to Kabil. And what does he do? He kills his brother Habil. Right? And here in Egypt you have you know, Osiris and Isis, and you have Sit, the brother, you know, of Osiris. Osiris is, is firstborn, and Sit is born before him. And Sit, you know, wants to have his wife, who's Isis. She's very beautiful. She's the goddess Isis, not that stupid group that was there in Syria, right? And, and that's one of the things that I hated about them, is they slandered the name of Isis. Uh, really, because ISIS is very important in history. And now you have Hotel ISIS and, and, and Aswan, and people are going to call the police, right? You know, have an ISIS hotel. Um, but, you know, o Osiris um, is like Habil, and Sit is like Kabil. And in fact, in our stories, uh, the story is very, very similar. You know, that Kabil wanted to marry his own sister because Adam and Eve always gave birth to twins a boy and a girl so you can't marry your twin that was forbidden but you'll have to marry a sister because it's the beginning okay and many ancient people believe that too the same thing that that's the way it was and that's also Egyptian mythology the same thing so he his twin is very beautiful and she will be the wife of Habil and so he kills Habil to marry her. That's one of, the Bible tells a different story, and you know, there can be different stories, but uh, that's the order of evil and the order of good from the very beginning. And it will recur like that over and over again. What do you do? You do dhikr. What do you do? You do tawbah. And the Prophet taught us that. That when you see these signs, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا when you see these signs, like tunnels in Mecca, doesn't mean that the hour is going to be in the next 24 hours. But when you see that, do lots of dhikr. And do tawbah. And, you know, one of the signs of the end of time is your and my death. In khuwaysatu nafsik, your little special thing, which is death. And when we die, God bless us and give us long and good lives, then it's the day of judgment. Day of judgment is here, you know, for you and for me. Um, I like that question, as you can see, and I took too much time, but I enjoyed every minute. And inshallah, what's the next question? So, uh, let's, ask, let's ask Leila first. Okay. Okay. Many of us have been wondering about the advice for the upcoming month of Rajab. Mm -hmm. no, no, don't ask that question. Don't ask that question. You ask that when Sheikh Muhammad comes. Wow. Okay, that's for him. Okay, will you do that? It's a very good question, but I'm not good at things like that. He would know exactly what to do. Yeah, that's a good question. We're in Rajab now, by the way. We're in Rajab, which is a sacred month. Yes. Yes, go ahead. This is more a very personal question. Um, 
but something I, I struggle with myself at this, this moment. Last year I put the uh, microphone uh, close to Last year I um, yeah. I came I came closer to Allah and to my uh, mm. to Islam very 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 much like never before in my life like spending hours and hours in mosque mm. and praying and all of this mm. and I was praying a lot a lot a lot for quite a few things and then I see people around me who uh, are not faithful or who, who don't mm. don't believe in Allah that much and don't do anything and they get what I pray for so at the moment, mm -hmm. yeah, I really have a lot of question marks and, and, and I don't know how to continue doing what I have done in that intensity. Can you help me? Um, well, you know, we, we, we must worship Allah for His sake. Yeah. We <coughs> must worship God for His sake. And because it is His right to be worshipped. And because it's beautiful to worship Him. And we can worship Him because we want things. Uh, of course, we do want the garden and we don't want the fire. But when we worship Him, you know, for things, you know, like I'll be successful and we'll make money and have a good career and my enemies will all be destroyed and, you know, then um, it's like we are hirelings, hirelings. We're like hired men and women. We're like maids and butlers. That I work for you, but you pay me. And you didn't pay me, I'm not working. One of the ancient Egyptians, you know, they used to go on strike. <coughs> they did lots of work. You know how they would go on strike? They go to their work and they just sit. They just sit. They don't say anything. They don't break any windows. There weren't many windows to break, you know. But they just sit there, and if you want the work done, you pay them. That was pretty intelligent, I think. But, um, <clears throat> you know, inshallah, whenever you make a dua to God, whenever you pray to God, He will give you what you ask for. Okay, and part of the adab of dua is that you have certainty that He will answer your prayer. And when we don't have certainty that He'll answer our prayers, then this is bad adab. Fad'uni astajiblakum. Call upon me, I will answer you. So you have to be certain He will answer you. Will He give you what you want? Maybe. Maybe not. Either He will give you that or give you something much better. Will He give it to you tomorrow? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not even in this world. But then, the more that He puts it off, and the more that He changes it, the better it will be. And for that reason it may be when you go back to Allah, you may wish that He never answered a single prayer. You know, because the ones he didn't answer, my God, look what I got. And you pray for something and maybe tomorrow you say, why did I ask for that? It turned out to be so bad. <clears throat> so be patient and, you know, God gives to all. He's a rahman This is his mercy. And he gives to the good and the bad, doesn't he? Not just the believers eat breakfast, you know. And some believers don't get breakfast at all, and some non-believers don't either. But God gives to everyone, you know, so He's very generous. And, moreover, a lot of times with the disbeliever, they've got to get everything here, because they've got nothing there. So God, Yu'adjil, He speeds up their rewards, because many of them, God guide them, and God guide us, they don't have any reward in the next world. So all the good they do needs to be rewarded here. So you get this, you get that, you get a nice big house. Um, I pray that God guides my country men and country women. Um, but if you go to my country or you go to our brother Benjamin's country, Germany, or you go to other countries, people have big houses, don't they? They have beautiful houses, don't they? They have, of course, the poor don't. 
But you have neighborhoods, you just go on and on. It's like the houses are all palaces, aren't they? And sometimes I look at that and say, I hope to God that you'll have a palace in the next world. I wish to God that you would be guided so that this palace can be a little palace and you have a big one waiting. But many of them, it won't be like that. This was your palace, now you have none. So God always gives the disbelievers because of their disbelief. He's very kind. He's very merciful. So you did good, good, you get now the reward. Your punishment, maybe it doesn't come here. It will come someday and it will be very great. For us, often, we may even be punished here so that there's no punishment later on. So, inshallah, be in love with your Lord. Be in love with your Lord and rely on Him and take what He gives you and be happy. Be idhnilahi ta'ala. Yeah. Okay, let's take a question. And we'll come back to Allah later, okay?